You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Bobby Jenks is managing on the south side. Yes, he is. I not, love it. Not, not at 35th and Shields, No, he's at course. Ozinga Field in Crestwood. But yeah. I love it. I mean, we've had the Thunderbolts people on before. Uh, we've had uh, members of that organization pop in at different times uh, to talk with us on Sox in the Basement. I, I've always liked that minor league team right here nestled amongst all the South suburbs. And, and now for Bobby to be managing there, uh, I know everybody's going to want to talk to Bobby Jenks. Uh, on their podcast, on their show, uh, on the radio. I'm going to hold out for Bobby being at the 9-foot homemade oak bar. I feel like we've had a couple of Thunderbolts folks on over the last couple of years that I should be able to hold out until we can get Bobby down here at the bar. Okay, He's actually debuting on my birthday. It, it's synergy, my friend. Oh, that is that is complete and total synergy. And yeah, I, th- I think Bobby at the bar would be a good thing. And you know, before anybody sits there and goes... But do you guys remember what he went through in 2005, why he was dumped by the Angels before the Sox picked him up? Just because you're sitting at a bar doesn't mean anything. It just means that's where we record. Right. Okay. I'll I'll drink apple juice for crying out loud. I just want to have him down here because it'd be nice to have him in person. You want him in the basement. You just want him down here in front of a microphone. We want to be able to shake his, what I assume is a considerably larger hand than I have. And, you know, and, and hey, if he's got to pull a hole through your wall because he can still throw 100, I'm willing to find that out. I would just love to have somebody down here at the actual studio bar who I have their picture somewhere on the wall. Like and that, his is right there. It's right under my wall. shoulder. That's the best part. It's right yeah, here. It, it, it is prominent. Big the bad Bobby Jenks. Bobby Jenks. I, I, you know, my favorite Bobby Jenks moment, there's two of them. One, his debut. I don't know how it worked out. We ended up with tickets where we had the beers right on the visiting dugout against the Mariners in his debut. And Lou Pinella's managing the Mariners, and he's up at the top step. And Bobby Jenks throwing over 100, that was a rarity back then. That Back then, that was a thing, man. You got a lot more guys that do that. That was a, that was a big deal back then. And he throws the first two pitches, and Pinella turns around and looks right at us and the rest of us sitting in the section and addresses the fans in the first few rows and goes, where the hell did you find this guy? And starts laughing. And like, I'll always remember <laughs> Lou Pinella. Lou Pinella is a good dude. <laughs> turning around and looking at the fans and go, where the hell did you find this guy? Like, <laughs> he was like in shock. And then there's the moment in game one, which I was fortunate enough to be at down the down the third base line. And I had myself and my father, and my mother and my sister. And, you know, you get four tickets. It's the immediate family members that go. I remember explaining that to the significant other. I remember my my sister explaining that like, no, 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 this is mom, dad. Me and my brother is what she was saying like that. The, you, the important people make it to the games like that game one of the 2005 World Series. And you have that eighth inning moment where Guillen comes out and he, instead of like just touching his right arm, does the give me the big guy thing. Yeah. Yeah. He did puts the arms out and the and right. then up and down. And the thing was like everybody in the stadiums watching him do it. That wasn't something you had to watch on TV. You saw Ozzy throw his hands out and look towards the, the dugout. And then you heard POD kick in the, with the uh, boys from the South. And all of a sudden, like the thing opens up and like, you know, lights are flashing and people are losing their minds. It's like a pro wrestler coming out. That's no different than hearing the glass smash and Stone Cold walking through the the curtain. That was the moment. It was the wild thing moment from Major League because as the song is yelling, boom, here comes the, the boys from the South. The entire crowd is yelling, boom, and like throwing their arms out. And like pumping their fists, like to have an entire stadium singing a song as this large man comes running out after his manager has said, give me the big guy in a major moment, game one of the World Series. I mean, I'm getting tingles as I talk about it and I'll have them until the show is over. Do you suppose Jerry was sitting in the owner's box going, I hate this effing song? (laughs) No, I, don't, I really don't think he was. <laughs> Listen, so then he comes in and he's got, I, I think he's got Bagwell at that moment. Okay. Yes. And that, that's a big deal. And he had been dealing with a back issue. And so now here comes in a guy 
with a with a hundred one mile an hour fastball. And my dad was so nervous during the World Series that he was running up the aisle and he was standing on the concourse. We're lower level. He would run up to the top of the stairs and he would hide behind the concrete post that is part of the concourse as if he were watching the movie Aliens for the first time because he always hated scary movies and he hated that movie. But as if he was hiding behind a pillow, he was so frightened he couldn't sit in his seat. He would run from seat number one up the aisle because he was on the aisle seat. You always give the big guy who got the tickets for you the aisle seat. He runs up the aisle and he stands behind the concrete post. And I look at my sister and I'm like, where did he go? She goes, he's hiding behind the post up there. And he's standing back there as Jenks is taking his warmups. And the first pitch comes across and Bagwell swings and misses at it. And I'm like, yeah. And I turn and here's my father who has run back down halfway down the section, pushes me as hard as he can in the shoulder and yells, he can't effing touch him. He can't touch him. Then he turns around, he runs back up and he hides behind the post for the next pitch. (laughs) (laughs) It's an absolute true story. It was, I mean, like, it's a real thing. And and I just want to tell Bobby that story face to face. Like, that's what I want. So, I mean, congratulations to him. You want that opportunity. So, Bobby, come on down. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations to him. And uh, I'm going to go out and see a few games at Ozinga. I always see a few of them. They always have wrestling nights there, I want to say, on Wednesdays or Thursday nights. And they bring in, like, the old pro wrestlers and kind of show up and yeah, still yeah, do their Billy thing. Billy Gunn show up there not uh, a while back? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Billy Gunn was there. He came out to the Ass Man song. It was amazing. Okay? I mean, like, that's... I, w- I, I will be out there at some point to watch Bobby manage and watch that team play, and we'd, we'd love to have him down here, okay? Uh, so so anyway, that's one of the big pieces of news. Before I get to the next one, remember this episode and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by Cork and Carey at the park, the place for pregame, postgame, in-game. There are no games right now, but there are still two-for-one burgers when you dine in on Mondays. It is an award-winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites. Uh, they are having a Halloween party, uh, adult dress-up Halloween party. Uh, check out corkandcarry.com for more information. Follow their social media. I might I might make an appearance there. I just don't know what I want to be for Halloween. I have to go to a costume party tomorrow. All my cousins are coming in from out of town. It's become like this impromptu party, like family thing, and they want to make it a costume party. And I still don't know what I'm going to be. Check out Cork and Carry at the Park, 33rd and Princeton, or Cork and Carry Beverly at 10614 Southwestern Avenue. See more at corkandcarry.com. Yeah, I don't I don't know what I'm going to be. I don't know. I, I don't I don't recall you doing a whole lot of costumes in in our when we were in younger our years and travels together. Yeah, well, I always I always go with the simple costume, right? Well, th- there's a picture of you right over your shoulder by Bobby Jenks of you dressed as a nun with a cigar. So yes, there's actually that. right next to Bobby Jenks is me in a nun's now outfit looking, with a yeah. habit and a cigar. My 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 buddy Joe is my my daughter's my oldest godfather. And for her first birthday, he gave her that. And the inscription underneath is, uh, Dear Audrey, uh, whenever you get into trouble, point at this picture. Love, Unky Joe. And it's me smoking a cigar in a in a full nun's costume. Yes, that was one of my standbys. I always had this like this box, but it was like like a foam box so it could fold. It wasn't bulky. And it was like a gift package. And the, all it had was like a big giant tag hanging off the side of it that said two, two women, women from God. Yeah. So I had that one as well. God's gift to women here. Yeah, and then I had the standby that I would pull out every once in a while where I just wear like, you know, khaki, khaki pants, a white t shirt, and big giant angel wings. And that was I would I would pull that off when I was younger as well. You know, there were a million girls dressed up as uh as uh sexy angels, and then there was me, and I look like uh, John Travolta in that movie. He was right. better looking yeah, than he, me, but he, I would tr- yeah, I would go for that. Okay. Yeah. But I never liked so, like the big makeup and the big outfits and stuff like that. And well, I, I recall one time at a radio station you and I worked at together, we were supposed to give some inspiring speech, so we were gonna do the uh the Braveheart thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we got wigs and makeup, and you didn't really want to do the makeup, but because of the style of your glasses and the wig, you just look like Weird Al Yankovic wearing a, a kilt. <laughs> it didn't really work for anybody. All right. Anyway, uh, other piece of news here, and I think this is interesting. Uh, the White Sox have hired a new bullpen coach. Yeah, Matt Wise from the Angels. Yeah, normally a bullpen coach is not a former MLB pitching coach, but Matt Wise has that has that background. And that's that's a high-level sneaky hire right there to have another person who's just working in the bullpen who's been a full-on MLB pitching coach. And and for a team that had some good pitching as well, I mean, I know that they regressed a little bit this year and they had some problems, but uh, the, two years ago, that was a staff, man. 
and 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 a mix of veterans and young guys too. So Matt Wise has done some work in this league. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a that's a really neat hire. And then of course, uh, what uh, uh, Jake Berger did a heartfelt like thank you to everybody. Uh, it was that, a very nice video. It was, yeah. it was a very nice video. I mean, I've I've had to come to the realization he's gone. In fact, the last couple times that I've been approached by a Sox in the Basement listener, they're like, "Hey, man, I, I know you liked him. Stop talking about him." <laughs> So I'm not getting into his video. No, I'm not, not playing a clip from it. He's gone. I understand he's gone. I've actually turned more to who's on this roster right now that I am just staring right at, wondering, are they going to do anything else? And I think the most intriguing guy on the roster right now is Andrew Vaughn. And this look at Andrew Vaughn is brought to you by Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. For exterior windows, doors, patio doors, and storm doors, this is your only stop. You don't call somebody up on the phone, go online, have somebody come out to the house, have them bring in some dingy windows. Then you bring another person out to the house. That guy's got windows, but they're not really the same windows. So you're comparing apples to oranges and there's a bunch of strangers in your house. Forget that. Go to their showroom. See full examples, the glass designs on display, the different accessories. All of it's right there for you. No pictures in a book. There's an owner in the showroom to answer all your questions. There's an owner on site with their own installers. They don't farm out the work. They've been doing it this way for 40 years. In Oak Forest since 1985. All major brands custom made, no stock items. That way you get a perfect fit. They are one half block east of 159th and Ridgeland. See them this weekend if you're thinking about replacing your doors or your windows. 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. Now, Andrew Vaughn. He's, he's certainly the biggest enigma, isn't he? Well, you got to know what he is now, right? We're talking about 2025 being competitive and all the roster uh, or all the payroll flexibility. We're talking about that over the last couple of weeks. And you could say, well, Aloy, but in reality, we already know what Aloy is. If he would get through 162 games without being injured, he'd be amazing. But I think he's a trade ship and you're paying a lot of money for a guy that isn't really coming back and providing you uh, a lot of wins above replacement, a, a, a lot to help your team along because of all the injuries, because of the defensive liability. But when you look at Vaughn, you got a guy who at 23 years old in his rookie year, it's 235 with a 705 OPS. That's a rookie year. I, I, I wasn't upset about that at all. 15 no, home runs. It, it, it was. And I, I think you and I, the, the biggest thing we did was we questioned whether or not 2021 made sense for him to be up right. because he was struggling and because of the very, very little amount of minor league experience he'd had, only 57 games, and it wasn't like he crushed it where he was hitting 278 and had an 858 OPS. Those are good numbers, but not like so dominating that you sit there and go, there's nothing else he can learn in Birmingham. There's nothing else he could learn from being in Charlotte, especially because he was only in Winston-Salem and Kannapolis in 2019. So then you you see the the next two years, and the next two years, that's what makes me nervous. Because in his year 24 and year 25 seasons, in 22 and 23, uh, he hits 271 in one year, 258 in the other. So overall, a 264 batting average over the last two years. Overall, over the last two years, a 747 OPS, an OPS plus of 106, which means just a little bit above above average. He's collected over 1,000 at-bats during those last two years. Total in his career, he's just a hair under 1,500 at-bats. And I don't see massive growth. I see over the course of two years, 38 home runs. So he's a guy who might hit 20 for you if he's if he's having a good year. And and I think I need more from him. Otherwise, you know what he is on a good team? You know what he is on a good team? He's a guy who's hitting sixth on a good team. Isn't that what he probably is? I mean, if you're a, where would he slot on the Rangers right now? Where, where would he slot on the Diamondbacks right now? Uh, on the bench. He might actually be on the bench for those guys, uh, to be honest with you. Right. So, I mean, I need him to, to make a, a leap in 24. If he doesn't make a leap in 24, he's one of the many question marks that you need to take care of then in 25. Th- this is his year. 2024 might not be a competitive year for the White Sox, but 2024 is a huge year for for Andrew Vaughn. Yeah, and, and there's nothing really to point at too with him that you sit there and go, okay, well, if he could fix this one thing, he could, you know, he could fix everything, right? I, I, he just he just doesn't show a whole lot of power. Uh, his strikeout rates are good. He didn't sell out for his 21 home runs last year. He really, you know, just hit a few more than he had hit the year before. His strikeout percentage went up a touch. 
but it was right where he was as a rookie at, at 21%, which is good. I mean, those are good numbers. His walk rate stayed about the same from 22 to 23 uh, in terms of the years, not the ages. But I honestly, it's just, it, it's really with him, you just kind of wonder. We were sold that this guy was a, 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 a just a really amazing talent at the plate. And so far, between the minors and between three years in the majors, he's shown himself to be good, but not not transcendent. He's replacement not level. Great. No, no, no. But yeah. he's, he, that's all he is. He's a replacement level player. His first two seasons came out to a zero B war. His his last year that he had in the majors, just this previous one in 2023, he was worth one win above replacement. Right. He's not he's not a major contributor to your team. And you drafted him third overall in 2019. You rushed him to the major leagues. You stuck him in the outfield, which probably also caused more trouble for him on top of the fact that he was trying to adjust to major league pitching even though he hadn't gotten a lot of at bats in the minor leagues because yeah, you see, were, you know, I, I'm not even sure that that makes a difference because how far out of line is it with what he was doing in a ball? Not maybe, maybe. I, I just think it. So it was one more thing, you know. One, well, he, yeah, he was sure. up here too early, and it was just like one more thing on the plate. Like at some point, you tip the scales a little bit too much on a guy. But now here he is. He's had he's had time to be the everyday first baseman. This is the year, right? Like you could say you could make up excuses for him, right? They played him in the wrong place. They rushed him up here too early. Yeah, he was he was caught uh, on a team that didn't understand they really didn't have an open window, but was still trying to win. So he was just being forced into a spot where he wasn't ready yet. But now there's not the pressure, and I don't believe there will be the pressure to go out and make the postseason in 2024. You're just not going to be able to build the team for that to be able to do it. And so what he has this year is the ability to grow as a player. And go out and be the everyday first baseman, but he needs to improve on those numbers. If you're the White Sox, if you're a hitting coach on the White Sox, if you're Pedro on the White Sox, if you're somebody in development on the White Sox, if you have a list of people that you need to work with this offseason and to improve in 2024 that are important to your team, his name is at the top of the list in bold and highlighted. It has to be. Yeah, and, and you need him to pick a lane, I think, too, as part of this is he needs to decide what kind of a hitter he's going to be. If you are going to try and get him to be a power hitter and a slugger and try and improve on the 21 home runs and try and get him up to the mid twenties or to, to, to the 30 level where a 258 batting average, like he had this year is going to make a lot of sense. Then you got to work on him pulling the ball or you got to figure out a way to maximize his power in some fashion. Okay. If you want him to be a complete hitter, and, and go for average, that's okay too. I, I think the Sox can live with that, but he's got to be one or the other because I think the idea that he's going to be a 300 hitter and a guy that's going to hit 25 to 30 home runs for you is probably, th- that level of growth just feels like a huge step that he would have to take. And so I would rather see him, you know, either try and do the, you know, the, the contact thing and see how often he can get on base and can he hit over 300 and can he just just be that guy then just try and sit there and see watch him sell out for power because I have a feeling if he tries to sell out for power, he's still maybe not going to top 30, but then he's going to be completely useless in other facets. So I, I, you know that's kind of what I would look for from him is what do we do not to fix this guy, but where do we say his growth has to be? And I would say I would rather at this point try and make him into – a hitter's hitter instead of trying to make him into a power hitter. Meanwhile, all that talk about Bobby Jenks taking over as the manager for the Windy City Thunderbolts reminds me of Butch Zemar, who's on the broadcast basement on demand radio network. He's got a podcast called the Zemar podcast. He just recently interviewed a kid that plays for that team. I love the kid when he was down here recording the interview, too, because I produced the show. That young man still believes he's going to make the show one day all the way from the Windy City Thunderbolts. And now he's got a former major leaguer as a manager. Butch, meanwhile, is working on open enrollment. If you own a business, if you're making decisions when it comes to the bottom line, you can make things better for your company working out a better health insurance strategy. It makes the employees happier, keeps them around, employee retention. You can lower cost. And if you've never considered getting insurance for your company or your employees, this is the time to talk to Butch. Doesn't cost you a thing. 
He's going to get the Elite Benefits playbook out. He's going to look at your business specifically. He's going to give you a bunch of options. He's going to talk you through the whole thing. You don't have to rush and get something done right now, but now is the time to get started. And if you have individual insurance questions, Butch is your guy. Give him a call today, 708-535-3006, or visit EliteBenefits.net. That music means only one thing. The Sox nerd, Dave Marin, back on Sox in the basement as he moves through the offseason and a recap and an A to Z on all these White Sox players and continues to work very, very hard when nobody else in the Sox is doing very much of anything, right? They're just watching the World (laughs) Series, right? There is no offseason for the Sox nerd, Chris. That's what I say all the time. That's good because I need the content. What do you got today? Chris, we forge on with our esoteric and alphabetical look at the 2023 White Sox. We left off at Dylan Seeds, so let's pick it up with Mike Clevenger, who was the Sox top starter for much of the second half. The long-haired right-hander did not allow a home run in 120 at-bats to the third and fourth hitters in the lineup in 2023. Clevenger faced the third and fourth men 60 times each with no gopher balls. The last Sox pitcher to face a cleanup man at least 60 times in a season without yielding a homer, was Jose Quintana in 2013, and the last righty to do that was Jack McDowell in 1994. Next, Oscar Colas. The rookie right fielder was nailed late in games. Colas hit 349 with a 373 on base percentage and 492 slugging percentage in innings 8 and 9 and an extra innings in 2023. In innings 1 through 7, Colas only hit 170. Colas hit 303 in the ninth inning. Since 1980, the only Sox rookies with higher ninth inning averages in a season are Eloy Jimenez in 2019, Yolmer Sanchez in 2015, Mike Caruso in 1998, and Tim Hewlett in 1985. Next, Garrett Crochet. The lefty did his best work, although limited, against teams that were 500 or better in 2023. Crochet did not give up an earned run in six outings covering 5.2 innings against teams above 500. This was the Sox's best performance in this situation since Donnie Beal's 12 appearances in 2012. And one more, Lucas Giolito. Remember him? The right-hander departed the White Sox third in franchise history with an average of 9.6 strikeouts per nine innings behind Dylan Cease's 10.8 and Chris Sale's 10.1. Giolito also left seven strikeouts shy of becoming the 12th pitcher in White Sox history to reach 1,000 strikeouts. His 993 Ks are fifth among righties in Sox history. Before I get to my zinger, I remind you that these gems and others on players like Diekman, Frazier, and Garcia, who did not make the podcast cut, are on my blog, which you can link to at SoxInTheBasement.com. My zinger? Well, it's more of a tribute, Chris, than a zinger. Wednesday marked the 18th anniversary of my favorite singular moment in White Sox history, Jeff Blum's home run in the 14th inning of Game 3 of the 2005 World Series. I love that homer because when Blum lined that ball into the right field stands at Minute Maid Park, I knew, I knew the White Sox were going to win the World Series. And kudos to the Blummer, too. He owns that moment and is always gracious and enthusiastic and happy when talking about it. That's it, Chris. More than you wanted to know about gopher ball to the third and fourth hitters, ninth inning hits, and Jeff Blum. The Sox Nerd, of course, brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and see everything they have going on this weekend and beyond at LamontDowntown.com. Who do you got in the World Series? I like Texas. I think Texas has, like, more really good players, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of partial to Arizona because let's face it, that was the last team that the 2023 White Sox defeated. (laughs) So it's almost like we won. Is that what you're going for? (laughs) The Sox last win of 2023 was against the Arizona Diamondbacks. I one of those, remember it was one of those weird day games in late in September. So, so that's, that's what we have to cling to. We, 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 our last victory was against possibly the world series winner. 
Let's talk about the Diamondbacks and how they accumulated some of the players that they got and how they built this team. And they got a bunch of different names on this team. A lot of rookies, a lot of trade acquisitions. And, and, and there's Christian Walker. Yeah. And and that is that is one of the ultimate who? Names in baseball, right? Did you see? How, a, I had to look up. I looked up their roster because people were complaining about the fact that, like, well, we focused on the Rangers on the last show. What about what about right. the Diamondbacks? And look, the Rangers are a more plausible thing for the White Sox to become because the Rangers really flipped it in two years from top to bottom. At basically every position is what they were able to do and in two did years. So by spending smart now, right? And and the thing is, and the White Sox, you take off those two high end pitching contracts, Degrom and Scherzer. Scherzer and Degrom. Ignore Max Scherzer and and, and Jacob Degrom from a Ranger standpoint because Degrom didn't contribute this year. You didn't need him if you're the Rangers and Scherzer. You can find a Scherzer like acquisition at a deadline where you don't have to take on the forty million. They did. But also, I, Scherzer wasn't exactly, he hasn't exactly been lights out for them down the stretch. No. So he's nice to have. But the Rangers got into the playoffs and largely got into the World Series, subtract $83 million off of their payroll for those two pitchers. Right. And the White Sox, the White Sox last season, not, not the one that just ended, not 23, but in 22, they, they had a $200 million payroll. So it's completely possible for the White Sox if they spend Absolutely. right to do what the Rangers do. Meanwhile, uh, you know, talking about the Diamondbacks, they have a deeper farm system. They're a more long-term plan. The Sox can do the Rangers plan and then morph into what the Diamondbacks are doing right now, but they need a few more years to do it. But like a guy like Christian Walker is a guy that they picked up off of waivers from Cincinnati in 2017 before the season began. He's he's a 33-year-old first baseman who's still in arbitration. Yeah, and he's just a guy who developed just late. You know what he is? He's Jake Berger. Oh my gosh, I'm back to Jake Berger. But he is. He's Jake Berger. He's a guy who developed late. Like, Jake is going to be in arbitration till the same age because it took him so long to get to the majors. That's what Christian Walker is. And, and, and so you can find those guys if you're smart about scouting and, and, and know where to look. Yeah, we had one, but we traded him to Miami. So now well, we have to okay, find yeah. <laughs> but But even like, even like back to the Rangers thing, it occurs to me that the Rangers didn't have a Dylan Cease in place, you know, when, when they started their rebuild you know, tried to turn this thing around in a couple of years. And what you have with the Diamondbacks is you don't have anybody that's really, uh, you know, a homegrown ace or anything like that. They've got Zach Gallen, who they've had for several years now, right? They got him from Miami in 19. And then yeah. Merrill, Merrill Kelly was a free agent signing from the Korean Baseball League. Right. Kelly was a guy that when he, he, had, an, he had an MLB career, it wasn't nothing, went overseas and came back a different guy. Right. right. And then and then if you look at it, it's really interesting. They're basically just using Gallon Kelly and their rookie, Brandon Fat. Is it fat? Fat? Right. Whatever it is. PFA. Well, we'll call him fat. I, I, it's not Brandon body fat. shaming if we call him fat. <laughs> and the guy's a rookie who just showed up this year. And, and and was a guy that lost. You want to talk about building a farm system where you have depth. OK, Brandon Fat lost the chance to be in the rotation coming out of spring training to Ryan Nelson and Tommy Henry. And Henry got hurt. He's, he had Tommy John. Um, but Nelson was the guy that, that they had in the rotation for most of the year. They've had like the corpse of Zach Davies By the way, it's as, fought. as a starter. It's Brandon fought. I don't know it's why fought. it's fought. It's well, fought. Okay. So he it's fought. fought. There's no O and there's no U in his name, but it's fought. So it's you fought. Know, yeah. Okay. Well, well. <laughs> You know what Brandon fought? He lost coming out of spring training. Now here he is. He's going to start in the World Series for him. So yeah. th that's, you know. But yeah, you don't have... The White Sox are going to take several years before that's going to be the case. And I, I know they just traded for a bunch of pr pitching prospects. So you can sit there and say, well, that's true. Yeah, but their best one is Schultz, who's 61 on MLB Pipeline, and he's in single A. And you'd be lucky if he showed up here by 2026. And 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 the guys that they traded for, you know, Eater, Nestrini, th those guys... I expect them to contribute, but to sit there and say that this is how you're going to do it, you got to keep in mind what the what the Diamondbacks have done salary wise, right? Kettle, Kettel, it's Kettel, isn't it? Yeah, it's, we, can't, it's we can't pronounce any Diamondbacks names. It's Kettel, Kettel Marte. <laughs> We're the podcast that can't say anybody's name. We, we cannot pronounce. This is why we don't do Diamondbacks in the basement. <laughs> um, but Marte is their highest paid player, followed by Merrill Kelly. Miguel Castro is a reliever. That's high paid. Mark Melanson is a, is a high paid reliever, and then really it's Corbin Carroll who's their big like young star, their version of Luis Robert Jr. 
and they've got him under a contract. He's their Montgomery, though. Think about it that way. Uh, like, but he's yeah, he's kind of more he is, their Montgomery. He was, he was a guy who was up there on those lists for a couple of years. They were just waiting to get there. Exactly. And, and everybody had him on a list. I know even in our fantasy dynasty baseball league, he was somebody that people were like coveting to just keep on their on their roster for a couple of years till he got there. Like that's a guy who had buzz the whole time that everybody expected to be good, but they had to wait on him, kind of like how the White Sox are waiting on on Colson Montgomery. But to round out their guys that are under contract this year, like veteran contracts, Jace Peterson, who is a 34-year-old utility man, and Scott Magoo, who is a 34-year-old reliever. And that's it. So you can't, you cannot say that the White Sox should follow the Diamondbacks path because the Diamondbacks path is going to take the White Sox a good like 10 years to really accomplish. And I don't want that. I don't, I don't want we that don't anymore. We, we don't need that. We just, want we just went through that it. and it failed spectacularly. And, and I don't believe in long rebuilds. I, I just don't. And now that, you know, I, I kind of, I fell for it just like everybody else, right? Like I swallowed the pill after watching the Cubs oh, we, do the long-term did. rebuild in 2016. And I said, oh, this is how you do it. You tear it down to the studs and you rebuild it back up and you just have to go through all the pain. But now I watch some of these recent winners and I watch the teams that are in the postseason that are doing it. And they're not doing it that way anymore. And I am more of the belief that, yeah, you got to you got to invest in in your your minor league system and you got to invest in in development. You got to invest in technology. You got to invest in coaching and you've got to build it up. But while you're doing that, you can still spend money and field a competitive team. You can still go out and get guys that are professional baseball players and you can still spend, especially with what the White Sox have spent over the last couple of years, you can still spend your way into making it into the postseason. And after watching teams that are lower seeds go on runs in these posts, in these, in these playoffs, I don't want to go through any more long-term rebuilds. The best I'm going to give you is 2024. I am not giving you 25 and 26. I expect you to be a playoff contending team when we open up opening day of 2025 that's what i expect from this team anything less is a joke because now with all the teams that are getting in and you can see these teams that can flip things around and i know this owner can go out and spend 200 million dollars because he's done it in the last couple of years in a single season i i expect that i i I, and, and every fan should expect it at this point no more long rebuilds no more of that garbage socks in the basement socks in the basement Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.